So for today, we've invited a first-time speaker, Jonathan Taylor, and he has, he's chosen the intriguing topic, the transformative power of a new story. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We, we have heard this recently, I'm sure. So how are we the ones we've been waiting for, Jonathan? <laughs> how or why? Why? Yes. How? All of the above. Or some of the above. <laughs> Well, I would like to first of all say, John, thank you. And in that experience, I wonder if you noticed, first of all, the way in which there was a structure that was offered. <clears throat> a structure that was based on what we know of what we believe learn about chocolate, energy centers, and that it's possible that we've had direct experience of those centers as perceptible experiences that are different from other experiences, <coughs> different from hitting your hammer with a thumb, different from sitting on something prickly different from looking into the eyes of your beloved. Something's going on there. And then, not only did he say, this is what's going on, he asked us to actually embody what was going on through sound. Now, one of the things that occurred to me as I was Engaging in that was how we all listen to ourselves and at the same time listen to each other. So that the actual pitch, tone, note that went with each vocalization was not pre established, it was found in real time. Did you notice how? You listened, and at the same time, listened first to yourself, but listened to everybody else, and how there was this almost chaotic clashing, if you will, or interference of the sound, and how as it went on, it found a harmonic, a harmonic relationship, each individual gradually found a harmonic relationship with the whole. And in some sense, that was signified by we all ended at the same time. We all knew when the toning had completed itself. Now, maybe that's just because we have a certain lung capacity, which is not a terribly different one from the next. We let go of the toning. But I'm encouraging you to look at how there was a collective understanding of what we were doing, when we were doing it, how we were to do it, and when it was to end. Now, that's actually the whole new story in a nutshell. We're done. <laughs> Thank you, John. Let's get to the donuts. <laughs> So, we're at a time in history, in, a, in the calendar, when one of the most important new stories is coming to fruition. And it could be the new story of the, un the unity between spirit and matter as represented by the life of Jesus. And what happened with that it might be the story of the Jews crossing the Red Sea and that the waters parted. That too is a story that continues on. Now, a story is no more true or not true 
than any other story. My friend says, stories are true and some have facts. <laughs> <laughs> I would assert that every story being true, it is a fact in itself. And in this process of story, it implies story making. <coughs> and we might even proceed to say that one of the things that distinguishes us from animals is the sentient capacity to make story. What's the purpose of making story? What is actually a story? We kind of hold it as, well, it's just a story. We say, we discount by saying it's just a story. And I'm, uh, my, my story is it's a great deal more than that. And I'm sticking to it. I'm sticking to my story. So, as we contemplate this business of story making, we are engaging in an incredibly human activity to contemplate the meaning of experience and create something around that. Not just learn from but create meaning is a profoundly human activity. And that meaning that we create in the making of story could be simply to explain something that has already happened. It could be to predict the future, that what has happened now will happen according to the story an hypothesis in the scientific way. Or, and, it could be that we are transmitting something through the story that is beyond the words themselves. That is to say, the construction results in new action. The construction not only results in a new idea about the world that is projected forward, but it also is transformative. It makes for new action. And who's to say what really happens here? Because we engage in all of these activities. Personally, we begin with a sense of beingness. How did we get to be who we are? Not why? But where did this come from? Because it's here now. And then we go to sleep, either figuratively or actually, and we wake up pretty much the one that went to sleep. There's a kind of identity that moves through time that we can watch. And as we notice that, we begin to look outward and look into the world and say, hmm, where did this come from? When did it begin? How did it get to be the way it is? And that is an experience based on physical sensation of being in the world of I am that asks the question, what is the story beyond this, beyond this personal life? And so science says, oh, it started with the Big Bang so-called Big Bang theory of cosmology, that there was a beginning before which there was what? Nothing. And now there is something. And since there was once nothing and now there is something, will there be a time when there's nothing again? Or where does the something go? Or why is it here the way it is here? All of these questions about the meaning of experiencing time eventually find their way into story making. And so, as John will tell you, some of the most incredibly interesting stories are creation myths that say, this is how it happened, this is why it happened, and this is what's going to happen.
but are those stories true? And does it really matter? What happens when we, for instance, and very specifically, come to the realization through observation that the world is not flat? Well, one thing it did was kick off centuries of exploration because people actually sailed off into the west and did not fall off the edge. <clears throat> In fact, if they kept going long enough, they came back to where they started. So the story of flatness and edgedness in our worldly experience, when that was replaced by a new story that identified, proposed, let's say, that actually the world existed as a sphere and thus had a continuous surface, when that was taken in and acted upon as though it were true, it was shown to be a pretty good act, a pretty good explanation of a physical reality that led to this wave of exploration. So that's an example of what a transformative story in retrospect can lead to. We might not know in the moment that the transformation is taking place until we act on it and then we reference back. So a transformative story is one that changes how we act, not just how we think or how we view the world, but it, it changes how we act in the world. So coming back to Jesus Christ, his story of the basis of the world's existence was love, is love, called individuals out of their isolation that they practice what he was speaking of. It was only an idea until people began, began to practice it. So, the transformative power of a new story is in itself a transformative possibility. When we admit to the possibility that as story makers we create our experience and we create more than that the meaning of our experience let's suppose that we could craft a new story that will lead to new behavior this has immense power as far as changing action. In so far as my experience goes, <clears throat> if I am the creator of my story, if I am a story maker, if the story that I create changes my act actions, and if actions in the world yield what we experience, that is to say, suffering, joy, fear, anguish, climate change, beheading, it places an incredible responsibility on this one, and on that one, and on that one. And because of that, there was called, back in uh, a, week, a year ago, summer, <clears throat> a call to attend what was touted as the New Story Summit in Finhorn, Scotland. And in part, such an, such an enterprise was cited at Finhorn because of the story that had developed there about the relationship to the unseen forces, the elemental forces, the representatives <coughs> of a larger reality that had come to work there, had been brought to work there, was an ideal situation, an ideal setting for the enterprise of discovering a new story for humanity. Wow, who could stay away from that? That's a, that's a great part. <laughs> and, and I must say, the great party that it was, in itself, was worth the price of admission. Now, one of the prices of admission was unspecified. That is to say, one of the new stories that was being tested at Findhorn for this summit last fall was Charles Eisenstein's gift economy. Now that's a new story about the way 
economy works in the world. A new way of treating our relationships, our economic relationships, as not transactional, but gifting. I do not give to you in order to get. I give to you, and that's as far as it goes. And the underlying story is, I will get what I need. But it might not happen the day that I hand you the, the $20 bill. So this is a fairly radical approach to the way reality, reality works. And they, the Findhorn organizers, with this monster event, said, we will operate according to the premise of the gift economy. Not donation, but gift. You see the difference? It's a subtle difference between what you donate. We go to Salvation Army and we donate our old sweatshirt. On the other hand, we pass somebody in the street who's sitting by the by the road on in, on Baker, and we give them to the loony. We're not going to get anything back. We're not going to get anything back from the Salvation Army, but we're putting up that which we no longer need. We're not taking something that is of current import and gifting it to whoever needs it. So they ran the conference based on the gift economy. And of course, Finhorn, being a physical location with lots of grounds and lots of buildings, had immediate needs. They had to pay for the food, they had to pay their staff. There was a huge cash flow that was going to be met exclusively by gift. More than that, they were inviting people who had no way of getting there on their own. And that there would be, the premise was, there would be enough left over, or there would be an additional amount generated through gifting that would provide the travel for people from all over the world who couldn't make it on their own, that couldn't make it on their own. That's kind of an interesting statement in itself. I can't make it on my own. I cannot make it on my own. And I, for to get there, because I was wildly inspired to do this, to get there, <clears throat> I engaged in a crowdfunding process in which I solicited gifts from people that I, cont that I could contact to help me get to my heart's desire, to help me to fulfill what my soul was calling for. And of course, I felt some obligation to give back, indeed. But in Charles's way of seeing it, I'm not giving back. I'm giving to a larger whole, which will eventually come around and give me what I need. And it turned out to be exactly like that. Not only did I get there, but I was able to help others to get there including two young people from Self Design High School who went to this conference, this international conference in Findhorn, Scotland, because of the gifting. And when the, t the figures were tallied by the administration of Findhorn, there had been 1,500 people there for over a week. They had a balance sheet that showed <coughs> way, way positive. They had not suffered a loss anywhere along the way. Everything was paid for, and more so. In fact, the scholarship fund allowed young people to come, allowed my friend Freddie Puma to come from the Andes, who couldn't afford to get there on his own, and he brought me this poncho. Now, what's this all about? How did this arise out of the history that you can see all the way to the point of the moment of this event. There's something going on here. So the conference took place. People came from all over the world, young people, old people, medicine people, ex-CIA people. And they all came in search of the new story. And I have to say that there was a great deal of time spent looking to one another 
oh, you've got the new story. Tell me what it is so we can get going here. What, what have you got to say about the way the world is and, and what do we need to do different and how can we do it? You tell me. There was a great deal of that in the very beginning and that's what brought people there. They saw the lineup of the stars who were not them, but they were the stars that were going to tell us and that something would come out of this of such magnitude that it would galvanize the world. It didn't turn out that way. It still hasn't turned out that way in the way that we might have imagined ahead of time. But there was a the first at first there was a kind of fumbling around. What are we doing here? Who's what? There was a se sequence of speakers that came to talk to at us. Who came to talk at us? And about a day and a half in, there was the beginnings of disquiet assembled convocation. And it started with, first of all, a note, because the, part of the process was to have something happening down here in the middle of this uh, amphitheater, and then microphones would be passed around to people ostensibly watching. And it began this process. First of all, we are not truly inclusive. What's the idea here? How come we don't have more of these people and more of those people? And the, for those folks who couldn't get here because of their grim situation, how, how did we come to speak for them? Fair enough. And so there was a certain amount of disquietude about that. Then it looked, we looked around, looked around this room. It's a bunch of ex-hippies, a bunch of white guys, people with privilege who can take time off and be here. What are we doing speaking for the rest of the world? Hey. And so, for about a day and a half, that got worked through. And then, the grief hit. And now, just when I say that, I can feel my whole body going, my hair standing up on end. There was a tidal wave of grief that spread throughout the year, 1500. And as it began, people were standing up. Oh, you have to think positively. Come on now, let's look ahead. We'll leave that behind. Okay, let's go get away from that. And that's when the conference really started. Without that grief process, we would still be fumbling around. Now, why was that so important? What were we grieving? What was the sadness that was sweeping through this? Young kids, some of them 10 years old, octogenarians, everybody was feeling it and fighting with it and resisting it in their own way. But what was that about? Is it possible that in order to approach what we're calling a new story, we have to find a good way to let go of the old? And more than that, to somehow forgive ourselves for the unintended consequences. How are we going to, now let's get real about this. Naomi Klein is going to come here and tell us that predatory postmodern capitalism is the world's scourge. It is the worst thing that ever happened. And more than that, we're going to have to change our ways in a very significant if we are going to get through this crisis, but it comes down to the effect of the story of how we're to be economically that has caused the crisis. The unintended consequence of unfettered predatory capitalism is climate change, combined with consumerism. End of story. And what are we going to do about it? So the matter of unintended consequence is deeply significant. And it is part of the grieving that must be faced and the forgiveness that must be faced if we're going to move into a new story. And that in itself is extraordinarily transformative. And it was what made that conference happen. It was allowed, the unintended consequences were allowed their time of grief <clears throat> until it ran its course 
as does grief and bereavement, a process that will eventually run its course and open up new space. A ten, uh, coincident to what was happening in the main convocation, every day there was ceremony led by various elders from around the world, indigenous elders. And these were meant to move beyond simple grief into restorative action, redemption, and forgiveness. So one of the ceremonies was about healing the schism between the male and the female. Another one was about healing the wound between indigenous, indigenous people and the dominant culture. <clears throat> and I just want to tell you a little bit about that particular ceremony. It was announced that this was going to happen and the various indigenous elders got together and cooked up some kind of ceremony. And they said, when we all gathered to begin this and we would walk through the land and over to a place next to um, the, the ocean where this was going to take place. And we were to walk from the main hall in such a way that we were led by the indigenous people. Right? So we were going to follow them to this ceremony. And this young woman raised her hand while this was being, being spoken and she said, but I'm, I'm of mixed heritage. Should I be in front or should I be behind? And the grandmother said, Honey, you walk where you want to. You can be anywhere you want to. And so we all filed along. It was about several hundred people, and we filed through the woodlands and into this ceremonial space. And part of that ceremony was to each one of the indigenous elders came around with what was a representation, a representative of a bowl of tears. And with an eagle feather, they dipped in that bowl of tears. And they touched every one of us and said, it's done. It's over now. It's finished. It's finished. And this went on for a couple of hours. because There were a lot of people there. And at the close of the ceremony, before we were released back into our daily life, one of the grandmothers pointed to this young woman who had asked that first question. She was sitting in the front row right on the ground. And said, this one is the future. This one. You see the future here in her. She is the joining of what was once separate. That's what I mean by a new story. And that's what is transformative about a new story, is in the telling, something changes. So, when it was done, that is when we dis dispersed from Findhorn and returned to our various ways, various places, there was an ongoing conversation online what had happened, what was good, what didn't work out. There was a lot of regret expressed that we were unable to create a manifesto that would transform the world, that there was not a product. You see how that is? Where is the formula for how to do this new thing? And a few of us noticed that the new story actually had already made its presence known in the way we were with each other in that circumstance. We became the new story for at least the duration of the conference. We related to each other with intimacy, transparency, respect, and honor, and open-heartedness. It was being enacted in the moment. But because we were inside it, it was hard to objectify it and make it something. Now what I have noticed 
since coming back from that conference is that there has been an ongoing stream of what I would consider spontaneous synchronicity that has been perhaps as a result of grace or something that we did or some of our aware that we touched in that made it possible for the nature of reality and experience and if you will the great mystery to deliver to my front door those who are interested in a new story I didn't have to go find them they came to me this was not happening before I went to Fenhorn. <coughs> it isn't something I said. <coughs> it isn't because I had a clever blog. The great mystery, such as it is, whatever it is, was delivering to my experience exactly what I needed. Not what I wanted, not what I desired, what I needed. come from an economics model that operates in that sense to actually experience it in the world moment by moment. So here's an interesting thing. We look at the origin of the universe and we create stories around that. And we are concerned for that because we've noticed that things pass. Things come, they exist, they persist, they go away impermanence happens. And if we extend that outward into the world and the observed observe world as far as we're, we've seen through cosmology, we have the sense that there is something going on that is logical, rational, um, knowable, and explainable. And so we create the scientific stories of the Big Bang and we feel a little more comfortable about that because it seems to include more of our observational experience. But it doesn't tell us anything about why or who we are. It explains and gives us a sense, if you will, a kind of elevated inspirational comfort that, my God, we're made of stardust. Think of that. Stardust is just stuff. And if we have a great romantic connection with stars and we realize that we are made of stardust, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> we are a star. Yes. I feel better already. <laughs> and then I read about ISIS. How come stardust goes about uh, decapitating them? You know? What is this? So, the implication is that something, there is a story that cannot be told, or hasn't been told, about just this. And my point is, when we open to just this, which is all of just this, we immediately reach for our story-making apparatus. We say, it's this, it's this, it's this. No, it's this. And irrespective of the story that we create, this keeps going. So what do we do? We figure, well, somebody is doing this. You know, intelligent design. Or in the beginning, God said, or, 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 even, it's always been this way, so what's the problem? There's no change. It doesn't agree, though, to what we, what we experience. Look at what being known as starters <coughs> does to your life. If the idea, the story, that the physical manifestation of our body arises from 
the explosion of stars, eventually finding their way into dust, into planets, into solar systems, into the origin of the world. Who's doing this? What is the story that says, who's doing this? The alternative, if we can't find that, or the story that some greater intelligence is doing this, doesn't fit, we're left with <clears throat> it's doing itself. The universe came into existence of its own accord. How does that feel? As a story about everything. This is reality doing itself. And our thoughts about it, by extension, are reality doing itself. That puts us in the position of being responsible and part of everything. Not just as individual experiencers of experience, but through the power of story creating everything explaining it to ourselves and living by our explanations. Isn't that the universe doing itself? It's a terrible responsibility. And yet, that's all we have. That's what's here. We are the ones we've been waiting for. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated, he, she separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on the first day. just what happened, but what could happen, the prophetic. And the prophecy, which is not creating certainty, but possibility, <clears throat> that says we are the ones we've been waiting for, originated as a new story amongst a group of indigenous elders who met in Overriding and Hopi Land in the early 60s, I'm uh, sorry, in the early 80s, to come to a new story. And this is what they said. You've been telling the people that this is the 11th hour, and now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. And do not look out yourself outside yourself for the leader. This could be a good time. There's a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there will be those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and they will suffer greatly. No, the river has its destination. The elders say 
we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above the water, and see who is in there with you and celebrate. See who's in the water with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, <clears throat> least of all ourselves. <clears throat> For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth ends and the journey comes to a halt. <clears throat> the time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So, in terms of a transformative story with leverage, notice what happens in the way you see the stewardship of the life that you are not given. How is that changed by allowing the new story to land? We are the ones we have been waiting for. And we say, not you are the one, but during this is the, the story that I heard about the formulation of this was they would get into a group and they would start giggling with each other and say, oh, you're the one we were waiting for. No, no, you're the one. No, not me. No, you're the one. These elders were just playing with that. Now, at this point, knowing or perhaps allowing this possibility that we are the ones we are waiting for, it isn't I am the one, it's we are the ones. It introduces the notion that collectively we are waiting for ourselves, that we are the ones we are waiting for, not just personally, though in our lives we can say so. There's two things being pointed to here as in terms of a new story. Do not look for the new story outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And notice that it's a we story, not an I story or a me story. And I wanted to just <clears throat> Context for this teaching story is a child living amongst the coastal Salish people on the edge of the Georgia Strait somewhere, 20 meters off the beach. A dense forest begins, impenetrable, relatively dark, filled with animals. And the young one is growing up here and has been playing further and further off the beach back into the <clears throat> it's called loss. Stand still. <clears throat> the trees ahead and the bushes behind, beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here. Wherever you are is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen, it answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, here. If you leave it, you may, you may come back, saying, here. No true trees are the same to Raven, no two branches are the same to ran. If what a tree or a bush does, it does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Stand still. The forest knows where you are must let it find you. How does that prevent a child from being lost? How does it prevent us from being lost? <clears throat> In 
that case, it was a very specific teaching about a physical condition. We can relate to this teaching as What is the forest? What does it mean to stand still and let the forest find us? What happens when story becomes an old story that must be left behind. New security becomes a prison. Comfort becomes a prison that must be left behind. Cherished beliefs become obstacles that must be left behind. When beloveds disappear from the stream of life. They're no longer in the river with us. When we confront our own death and become that which, as the ancestors say, you are where we were once. We are where you're going to be. And in that, the circle is complete. Native American spirituality, shamanic work, and and the genus, and the genus, and the genus, I don't know. What is that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Let me finish reading, and then he'll explain. Right, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> um, in his coaching practice, he helps mature adults become elders in their deepest sense. As well, he's involved in rites of passage for young men. While his life is about service. What he loves most in this world is the play between not two and unabashed individuality. Wow, that sounds great. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> Entheogens, it's a name, it's a term that comes out of primarily the work of Gordon Wasserman, who spent a good deal of time in the 30s working with an indigenous woman who, from northern Mexico, who was a curandero using sacred mushrooms. And in the culture of plant medicines, and there are many cultures that use them in the Amazon, in northern Mexico, Siberia, and so on, the Use is either for healing or power, power over. And it was the work of Gordon Wasson with the mushrooms that led him to use this, make this term called entheogen. That is something that generates the experience of God or spirit. Entheogen. And it made his teacher, Maria, deeply annoyed that he reframed what was happening to him. Because she said, if I need to find God, I go to the Catholic Church, and that's what it is. But what's happening here is something else. And he brought the two together. So we call them entheogens, and in, in a sense, it is the use of plant medicines for the purpose of spiritual growth not for the purposes of creating or acquiring power, 
not for the purposes of healing physical ailments. Does that help? So, are there other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> What's the word again? Entheogens. Entheogen? E N T H E O G N S. E N T H. So like Theo, like the uh, theocracy, I think E-N-T-H-E-O-G-E-N-S, and theogens. <coughs> so an from? example would be ayahuasca. That's one possibility. Tobacco is another. Detura. And uh, peyote. Sorry. Ibogaine. Ibogaine, of course. What, what, what? Ibogaine. Oh, it's, Ibogaine is very powerful. Just other. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you have heard somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that somewhere. Was that a plant or a mushroom? So we have other questions here. That's a plant. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. A comment is fine. I, I was, a lot of stuff was very yummy, but what I will say with is oozing the water with me. That gave me such a strong evocative mm -hmm. thing I can that almost became tangible. Mm -hmm. And also, that has not been operating in that manner, letting nobody pay for themselves for a long time. And they were told that in North America that wouldn't work. People would come just for having a place to live and free food. You cannot pay for yourself when you do this 10 day meditation where they hold space for you to shut up mm -hmm. and eat their food. and travel inside. What was the, tell me again the organization of the... Vipassana. Oh, the Vipassana, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Vipassana. You can only pay Vipassana. for the people that will come yeah. after you. Yeah. yeah, and a dollar or a million dollars yeah. is up to you. Nobody's looking at holding the app. But I always thought that was fascinating because we never lacked for food and we could never complain because it was given to us. And I think it's a good, uh, a good formula. And I came up with that myself a bit ago in here, uh, that if we would always take care of others yes. and never of ourselves, but count that somebody would take care of ourselves while we're taking care of others, it would make uh, for a good uh, a goodwill. Yeah, so there. <laughs> OK. Thank you, John. That's your story. <laughs> That's You're my sticking story. to it. <laughs> <laughs> your story works. It's really good. <laughs> I'm, I'm part of her story. We're in the river touring together. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I'm so glad about that. Ananda, please. I hear the very, I was very confused when I came here from Europe. And uh, I heard about natives. I was um, having two, my gods and natives in Bohemia, mm. and uh, they are still with me. They still are guiding me. Mm. And I couldn't relate, but I was one time teaching in Barnaby, Qigong, and whatever I was teaching young people to learn how to live. And they came, they ran from UBC until Barnaby. Mm. They had been not running very well. But they have been telling me that they have been having me in dreams from LSD. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is LSD? Mm -hmm. It is some kind of, it is not divine. It is some kind of organization. <laughs> <laughs> or what it, what it is. And they told me, oh my god, you go so high. And I said, you know, I am, I am only dealing with my consciousness. Yes. And I don't know what you are talking about. It is some kind of drug. So they try to explain me. But they started to run from me after the Qigong and after the energy that was flowing so much that they screamed on people on the streets. I said, oh my god, we might create something in Vancouver. And so I have been very much uh, sort of watching the groups. Mm and watching, especially here in Kutnis, I could hear, hear the energies, and I could hear 
how it is used or misused, mm -hmm. that you very much presented it very much from the deeper consciousness of it. And so for me, I always offer prayer to it. Mm -hmm. And I give it to divine, and my only secretary is divine, mm -hmm. and divine mother, that I can't trust anything else. So I always offer prayer when I hear some stories or whatever they are. And so I, I hear that this sentence, we are waiting for you, have been read to me on telephones, you have to come back wherever I was, <coughs> New Zealand or Australia, or you have to come back, you have to come here. I was more hearing my karma with mm -hmm. my family that I have to really come back. And so I have been watching the shows like that mm -hmm. and watching the people's energy. And I always have been hearing that they have it all within them. They can only still enough to hear it. And there are many, many, many tools for that. Mm -hmm. But depends what we hear what we need for that particular part of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But it is in listening. Mm -hmm. And the Maori, they connected me very deeply. They have me, they, were, they have been having me in their dreams. Mm -hmm. And so they found me. And Maori, this particular Baitaha, it's called Baitaha, mm -hmm. they have been Maori that they have been so big and so it was very hard to look at them, therefore you would be on the floor. And they have been having led by women. It was very interestingly designed. And the women will meditate, and when they have any question, and give it to the men, and the men will stay with it and after act with connection to the women. And they have been very, they have been inviting me to their inner ceremonies and I didn't want to go. I said, I am white. Mm -hmm. I don't belong here. And they were saying, you have been guided by star, mm -hmm. by dog star, like we are, you are us. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. I am I am us. So I used them and they gave me incredible stones, yeah. such white stones. And they showed me how the certain layer of something like that can happen only when it is connected to the deeper layer. Yes. When it is guided from that, what you said, yes. we are all waiting for us, yes. and we are us. So I accepted it. They tied me to the chair. Mm. They didn't want me to leave. Uh. <laughs> Almost when I was going to the aeroplane. And they, I have, they have to let me go there for I have to clear still many levels here. And so they, they have been quite incredible for me of the inner connection to the ancient, ancient tribes. And they have been also one man from ancient tribe was selling t-shirts and there was everything written what happened wrong to them on that t-shirt. And I stood there and I was having tears in my eyes and I was telling him, you know, I don't know. I would be unable to put it on t-shirt. I would have to put it around the globe. The whole thing would happen with us. But this is not that. This is not the not really we are. And he said, I'm not selling any more the t-shirts. So he stopped selling it. He was going inside. And listening. Yeah. What is <laughs> so it is. Uh, it is quite, uh, quite, very deep to connect that. And I, I always feel that every step that we are, we are connected. We are connected to the whole, and we are connected to that special part that it is just happening with us. We call it divine flow. Thank you so much for opening this.
pass it the other way around. Why? Well, you don't have to wait. <laughs> Any other uh, questions or comments? While we're passing the, the um, cards and while we're passing the baskets, are there any other questions, comments? I really appreciate it your talk because it, it was so unrigid. There were not stories for destruction, stories for creation, stories that we can't even imagine, things that are happening right now, right here in us. Possibility that it's being created right now. Stardust. I like it. There's room for everything. Isn't yeah, there's room for, and the idea that's in motion, that it's we're not static. We had static stories of, and some of them were, mm, you know, full of prejudice or narrowness or defining ourselves as rigid, and, and um, stories were wonderful ways to move children in places right. that were stuck. But this new story, it doesn't have an end. It's no. so beautiful. It just keeps evolving. It's <laughs> 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 so <much> <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is very good. <laughs>